Good evening, my name is Holly. Welcome to Forward Meet the Poet with Caroline Bird in conversation with Leif Arbuthnot. Now I can see our audiences are just starting to log in but not everyone is here yet. So while we're waiting for everyone to arrive, I will explain how the chat function works. Um, so if you haven't used a Zoom webinar before, you just hover the cursor over um, the center of the screen, my face, and underneath you should see a toolbar appear along the bottom. And one of the options there is a little speech bubble with chat. And if you click on that, the chat bar should open on the right hand side. Now then you can um, put little questions there or you could um, just say hello and say where you're coming from. But when you do, you have a two option and you need to click all panelists and attendees because that means we can actually see um, what you say. And I will kick us off by um, putting a link to where you can buy um, Caroline's book directly from Carcanet there in the chat. Um, and I will make sure it's to all panellists and attendees. Fantastic. And I can see a couple of people saying hello. We've got Claire Collinston from Brixton and we've got, who else we've got? Oh, Joelle Taylor's here from London and who else? And John Mead from Sunny Cork. Uh, we've got, oh, it's coming in too fast for me to read now. We've got Brooklyn and North Wales and Cumbria and Ayrshire and Sheffield and Edinburgh. Oh, fantastic. And I can see that the numbers are starting to level off. So I will do our introduction of LEAF. So we're going to be talking for about 45 minutes. Um, Callan Bird will be reading from the air year and she will be answering questions set to her by LEAF Arbuthnot. Um, LEAF is a journalist and poetry critic whose reviews have been published in the Sunday Times, the Times Literary Supplement, Ambit and elsewhere. Um, she's also just been made acting features editor for Tatler in the past week. So congratulations on that, Leaf. And her first novel, Looking for Eliza, was published by Orion in May. And it's about a cranky poet's unlikely friendship with a young woman in Oxford. So I'm very well, I'm very pleased to welcome Leaf. Hello, Leaf. Hello. Thanks Hi. for having me. <laughs> Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you everyone for uh, for participating. I know that at this stage with Zoom we're a bit um, you know tired out by Zoom but um, I think it's just such a really really exciting opportunity to hear from Caroline Bird who is one of the best poets writing in the UK. Um, so this is her collection The Air Year. Uh, Simon Armitage said of Caroline's poetry that it erupts spring-loaded, funny, sad, deadly. I think he's absolutely right. And he also said that um, you don't know if a bullet will come out of the barrel or a flag with the word bang on it. Um, one of the things I most love about this collection is its energy. Um, it feels absolutely coiled, um, ready to spring. Every poem is un unpredictable, in fact, every line. Um, and it's not just showing off or ripping the rug out from under you. Uh, there's also a real humanity to the poems, a tenderness in the relationships that they look at. Um, they're also, really sensual and sexual and celebrate the female body in particular. Um, it's a total joy to read. Um, I, I loved every poem and I'm recommending it to everyone that I know. And I hope that if anyone hasn't, you know, bought the collection, they will do because it's really, really worth your, your, your time and your money. Um, Caroline has uh, five previous collections of, of poetry. Her first was published when she was doing her GCSEs, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, and um, they're published by Carcanet. Her, her 2017 book, In These Days of Prohibition, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, and she's been like nominated for and won loads of prizes, so it'll be boring to list them. Um, she also writes plays, including The Trial of Dennis the Menace, which is a, an amazingly entitled play that I didn't get a chance to see, but I really want to. Um, and she was one of the official poets of the London Olympics, um, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to have her reading and talking about her work today. Um, so, Caroline, do you want to come on the Zoom? <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much for that introduction. My pleasure. Um, would you like to start with Nancy and the Torpedo, which is a poem early in the collection. It's slightly longer than some of the other ones, but um, I think it does. It's just an amazing poem. So go okay. ahead. Right. Throw, throw me in the deep end here. Right. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's quite a long poem. So, uh, so buckle up. Um, it's called Nancy and the Torpedo. 
Nancy found an entire torpedo in the forest, just lying there like a beached whale, coated in wet leaves and decorated with glittering snail trails. It's a fucking torpedo, she said. Is it live? I said. I didn't know how torpedoes worked. Were they like mines? It's inert, she said, suddenly an expert. Torpedoes don't explode on land. Everyone knows that. She whistled like a plumber surveying a damp patch. He's a beauty, all right. I reckon he weighs at least 600 pounds. 640, I'd say. He, I said. But Nancy was already straddling it, spanking its rudder like the rump of a prize horse. What's a torpedo doing in a forest? Nancy rolled her eyes. You always ask the most obvious questions, don't you? Can't you just enjoy the moment? She'd already unzipped her trousers and was touching herself grinding up against the girth of the weapon and groaning gently. Careful, I said. Her orgasm gathered to a scream. She pressed her sweating face on the warhead and fell asleep on top of it. The torpedo precisely matched the length of her body. To my tired gaze, it seemed as if they were both breathing, Nancy and the torpedo their chests rising and falling together like unsuspecting ocean waves. I pictured them both in action, underwater. Nancy's legs wrapped around its speeding shaft, her red eyes fixed like sniper dots on the target of the head, a string of bubbles flying out behind her like a chiffon scarf. Eventually she woke, refreshed and cheerful, patted the torpedo goodbye, hoisted on her backpack and we continued our journey as if nothing had happened. Where are we going? She'd ask every 10 minutes or so. We've just got to keep moving, I'd reply, pointing in some arbitrary direction and striding with purpose, trying to channel the sexual energy of a self-propelled missile. Keep on moving. The dread swished around my gums like someone else's tongue. If I had owned a penis, it would have secretly shriveled in my pants. We've passed this clearing before, Nancy said. Different clearing, I said. Those are our footprints from four days ago, she said. Different footprints, I said. Then we saw the torpedo. Nancy laughed. I suppose you're going to tell me that's a different torpedo. It was getting dark and cold. I love you. I just love you so much, I said as Nancy remounted, hugging it and whispering into its back, her mouth almost kissing the metal. That's when I lost it. I'm sorry I'm not a fucking torpedo. I can't blast through shit. I'm lost and I'm useless and I've got no fucking idea where I am or what I'm doing. There, I said it. Go ahead and dump me because I'm a piece of shit. There was a long silence. Nancy straightened her spine like a dressage rider, looked at me for an age, then said, how many times do I have to prove it to you? Prove what, I said. She sighed. What could be more useless and impotent than a dud torpedo in a forest? I don't understand, I said. She peeled a snail from its propeller and threw it at me. I know exactly who you are, she said, slapping the steel. You and him are headed in the same direction. You mean nowhere. She unzipped her trousers and reached down. Fat tears appeared on her cheeks like rain. I didn't understand why she was crying. You stupid idiot, she said, her breath quickening as she rubbed and grinded. Can't you see I'm doing this for you? Can't you see I'm exploding for the both of us? Thank you for that. That was amazing. Um, so, yeah, quite a long one to get us in the, in the zone. Um, I've got a question here um, that, that kind of taps into a question that I, I was going to ask myself. And it's from, it's from, uh, it's from Claire Proctor. Um, and she asks... How important is bravery in a poet? In a poet, um, so to what extent is a good poem a poem that's willing to speak a truth? Um, uh, you know, it, it, how much how much does bravery kind of weigh in here? Um, and I, I I kind of think that question really works with this with this poem in particular because it is such a brave poem. It's so kind of extreme um, and also so vulnerable. Um, so. It's such an interesting question, like because bravery is. A, a kind of a strategy in, in terms of it's something you stumble across rather than something you have to you don't have to start out with it in the poem for me what I do is I try and start with as as little as possible so I have a I fling open the door of a first line 
Um, well, with this one, you know, Nancy found an entire torpedo in the forest. Mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd, I'd written a list of words down and torpedo was one of them. And I said, right, I'm going to put that in the first line. And then I had that first line and then I didn't know why there was a torpedo in the forest. I didn't know who Nancy was. Um, so I had to start writing in order to, to find out what the rest of the world was. And so then the dialogue became, you know, when I was, the speakers talking about not understanding, I, I'm not understanding as I'm, as I'm writing and, and I'm just following the images. So I'm not consciously trying to be brave. I'm just, I'm just letting cinematically the, 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 I'm building the road as I'm walking down it in my imagination, if, if you get what I mean. Yeah. And then, but the thing when you do that is your subconscious takes over. So then, of course, the poem becomes about all your deepest sexual insecurities and becomes <laughs> so much more personal than you'd ever intended. And that's why it feels like a kind of conscious bravery, because it, it, it inhabits the most personal part of you, like your dreaming self almost. And like, if I'd, if I'd said to myself, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write a poem about, you know, the sexual insecurities I had as a teenager around bisexual women, I'd be like, no way I'm writing that poem. I don't want anyone ever to hear that poem. And that's not how bisexuality works. And that's, you know, that, no, <laughs> not doing it. But just to start off with that image, suddenly the poem, well, you don't have a choice. You know, and, and, the, and, and the a, made. Yeah. there's a bravery as well, though, in like not taking that stuff out, not being like, oh, this is mine. This is my own, you know, story of insecurity that I'd actually rather keep quiet. Thanks very much. It, it, it's true that the, 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 I guess the bravery comes in just uh, committing to the process of discovery, like yeah. not thinking you've got to tell the poem something, letting the poem tell you something, no matter how uncomfortable that something is. So mm -hmm. I guess that. That is that is where the, the bravery comes from is letting letting the poem talk back to you um there's also something about the kind of there's a sort of fable quality to this poem it's almost like a short story um and i wondered in the sense of kind of the picaresque like a, a journey you know th well it's, it's literally like a sort of journey through a forest which is a kind of a, an amazing trope in other kinds of poetry you know obviously dante and other kind of um yeah stories so i, I wondered what you like poems to do to you as a reader and um, do you like to be taken on a journey or, or, or i mean it's um yeah what 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 do you, what effect are you looking for from when you read I, I mean i love the fact that poems are as alive and unsolvable as people that you come back to the same poem day after day and it affects you differently and it means something else you know i like the fact that the, the poems I most enjoy are a bit like kind of being punched in the dark. Like you don't know why you've been punched or who you've been punched by, but you, you feel the effect of it, you know? It's just like if you stand in front of the ocean, you don't go, well, what does this mean? You know, like <laughs> it's, not, it's not solvable, but it's an experience. Yeah. So what, what I love, the, the poems that I love the most are the ones that I experience afresh every time I encounter them, no matter if I've read them a, a, a hundred times, you know, like, yeah, like yeah. meeting a living thing. Yeah. Um, Laura Warner asked an interesting question, partly about where you begin writing a poem. And I think you kind of talked about that a bit, but also about like whether you make early decisions about tone, diction, mood and rhythm. Um, it sounds to me like maybe you don't, but like, but how, how much does the poem come out in the way that it, that it, you know, with the mood and the diction and the kind of like line endings that it comes to you when you're writing it? So the, in the first draft, for me, it's all about the cinema and the images and, fi and figuring out what the game of the poem is, it, uh, like in terms of, for, for example, there's a poem I, I, I'm going to read later called Dive Bar, which does all these really like complicated linguistic things. But that, that came later. The, the first draft was all about like, because it, it goes in, into through people's like digestive systems in, in, a, in, a, in a bar and like and I was just trying to figure out what the pictures were first and yeah. then afterwards I go back and I go okay like this what is the what is the best form to fit this beast that I've created but to begin with it's just about um, building the, the world and, and being able to see it first yeah I don't want to prune the tree before it's a tree do you mean yeah. so I don't want to make it all like neat and 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 something if actually that's not how 
not not what the poem should be. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, I think maybe should we do your well? You would do you read your second poem? Check out, please. Yes. Which is shorter <laughs> and also great. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Check out. I think so. This is death, and wonder why I can still see through my eyes. An angel approaches me with a feedback form, asking how I'd rate my life. Very good, good, average, bad, very bad. And I intend to tick average, followed by a rant. Then I recall your face like a cartoon treasure chest, glowing with gold light. Tick, very good. And in the comment box below, I write, nice job. The angel asks if I enjoyed my stay. And I say, oh yes, I definitely come again. And he gives me a soft look, meaning that won't be possible, but thanks all the same. Clicks his pen and vanishes. Thank you. Um, I, I really admire one of the things I, I, I really appreciate about this book is that um, your, the poems are really dense. They feel like even if they don't take up much space, this poem doesn't take up much space. It feels like they weigh pretty heavily in your hand if you, if you got to um, hold them. Could you take us through how you, how you kind of, um, how you wrote Checkout and like whether it, you know, what sort of process you, you went through to kind of get it to that sort of um, size? Yeah, so um, the epigraph of the book is by uh, Thomas Tranströmer and it says, um, in the middle of the forest, there's an unexpected clearing that can only be found by those who have gotten lost, right? And for me, all the short poems, they came, nearly all of them, they came as unexpected clearings that I found at the end of really, really long rambling first drafts. So that weren't, that weren't working. And then suddenly it's like a sonnet, like, like an unexpected clearing in a forest just, just appeared. And because I decided with this book to not give up on first drafts, even if I had, even if it was not working, I was like, I'm just going to keep going like, like Nancy, the, like, like, like being lost in a forest. I'm just going to keep going until I stumble on something. So this poem, bizarrely, was a really long, awful poem about a panic attack. And, um, and I was just getting so bored writing about this panic attack. So eventually I just... And I was trying to try that thing where you think, oh, I'm going to die, you know, and <laughs> I, was, I was so bored writing it. So I was just like, then, right, well, I'm just going to die in it. And then, and then I, I think, so this is death, right? This is the end of like four pages. <laughs> and then suddenly this angel appeared and then I, it was a love poem. And there it was, right at the end. Uh, it was the unexpected clearing, which, which I think is interesting because because maybe that's why they feel a bit more haunted because I think bizarrely if you write a long long thing and then chop it all off a, a bit of everything that you got rid of haunts that that part that remains somehow. Definitely. Yeah I, I think um, I'm, I'm interested by this idea that like yeah that the, the kind of kind of flavor or mood you know can can remain do you, do you with all the those offcuts do you do anything with them or are they are those for the bin? <laughs> I put them in a file on my computer called random shit <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be like trawled over so <laughs> watch out um uh yeah so so oh yeah well one of the things that i found i find striking about this poem in particular but i think it happens really in all in all your poems in, in this collection is this sense of um this element of performance um there's a kind of dazzle and a showmanship to the poems um and i i so in this poem it comes out when you know, the, the angel kind of, um, well, this kind of clicking of the pen, sudden disappearance, like a bit like, you know, in a, in a cartoon when someone throws some dust, some like sparkle stuff on the ground and, and vanishes. Um, yeah. so I wondered when, when you'd kind of discovered that, that, that words could be used for um, kind of, you know, showmanship and razzle and kind of that sense of like, you know, forcing discovery upon people who are, you know, sitting glumly reading. When did I first discover it? I, I don't know. I, th I think it's, for me, writing is constantly a process of trying not to be bored by my own mind. Yeah. And, and if, I, if I read something I've written and I read it back and it doesn't do anything to me, no matter how clever it is or how like, much effort I put into the language, hmm. you know, 
if it's not alive, then it's, it doesn't feel true. It feels, you know, uh, it, uh, so, so I, so I guess like, I, I, I don't quite know how to how to explain it but it's it, oh I know how, it, what's so interesting to me about poetry is is like I'm constantly trying to unlearn everything I know about poetry in order to encounter it afresh like I haven't written a poem for a long for quite a while now since mm. writing this book because I've got to figure out a new way of doing it because I've mm. I've done this way now and 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 actually I've got like two use to wandering in that way so I've got to find a different way to wander mm. otherwise I'm just encountering the same things um so it's the unlearning and it's the kind of childish like well I didn't expect I didn't expect that that to happen yeah. or it's, it's that feeling of unexpectedness has to come from me me being surprised yeah and, and then that's also where the the like pain like bubbles up through the poems because uh, I'm not guarding myself against it, if that makes yeah. sense. I'm not trying to put it in it, but I'm, I'm, I'm not protecting myself while I'm writing. Yeah, it's so interesting you say, because like a lot of writers generally would probably think that, you know, you had to like build up, you know, the, the kind of find out how you, how you write like a novel or, you know, a nonfiction book and then kind of just get better at that, you know, at that sort of repetitive action. But um, it's, it's really interesting to hear that you're trying to sort of break the wheel and then build a different sort of thing. Well, one of my favourite quotes is by, uh, so Winslow Zimborska, when she won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1996, she, she, she got up and made a speech and in it she said, um, uh, whatever inspiration is, it's born from a continuous I don't know. Right? <laughs> And I yeah. love it. She just won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, you know, great. <laughs> the idea that the job is to continually not know. Yeah. And that and that that there's a kind of discipline in in that itself. You know, because everything else in the world is telling us we have to know stuff all the time, and telling us not to be surprised, and telling us to impart wisdom. You know, and to have something to say. But mm. if you if you have if you approach a poem with something to say, then you're it's not going you're not going to stumble upon an, a, an epiphany. In a, yeah. you know, to use a grand term, but you're not going to stumble upon anything true because you've approached it with significance. Your top hat. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. 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 Totally. Um, could you possibly read the red telephone, please? Which is yeah, on page yeah. nineteen for people who have the book in front of them. The red telephone. When she phoned to say, "I'm shivering in the rain." You hung up and cried. When she phoned to say, I've popped a few mystery pills, now I'm swaying on a bridge. You said, I wish things were different and cried. When she phoned to say, I'm on the floor and a man dressed as a centurion is standing over me holding a cinder block. You said, crying, thank you for the information. When she texted to say, I'm purplish, my nose feels like a hole. All I can see is a storm grate crudged with yellowness behind my eyes. You replied, I love you. And then you cried. When she emailed to say, I'm falling asleep with a cigarette in my hand and my room smells of petrol. You typed, God, that sounds awful. I'm so sorry. Then wrote to this poem whilst crying. Now our house is burning down and you're still writing. This poem will not drop everything. Sit up, get up from this stale sheet and go to her. Look, it's just sitting here. And when her ghost returns to you in the night, trailing plumes of smoke like various scarves, crying, where were you? Through your tears, confused, you'll say, but you never asked, you never said, you never told me to come. Thank you. Um, so part of the pleasure of reading your work is that you offer readers um, encounters with really failing people, you know, insufficient people. And, and in, in this poem, there is that, and it's very human. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in the figure of the, of the writer in this poem and like, you know, who's too absorbed in, in the work really, or maybe to be kind of a stand up person in real life when it, when it counts and matters. Um, and I, I wondered if that tension exists in your own life, if you feel that that there's a kind of, that if you struggle with the sense of a gap between 
um, your the kind of quality of your work and the quality of of like of you as a person, like moving through daily life, because we all are, are crap, you know, when we, most of the time, not most of the time, but um, yeah, if, if you could answer that, that'd be, <laughs> maybe it's too personal, but. No, that's fine. It, it, you're right. It's, there's a strange thing where you're writing about, and in the process, you know, figuring out stuff to do with what it means to be a human, but then that doesn't, that, that, those truths that you sp stumble across in those unexpected clearings don't necessarily translate to to your life at all mm -hmm. you know sometimes a, and, and a, sometimes a poem uh, can almost feel a bit like a prophecy like it will tell you what you're doing wrong or tell you you know to uh, what the pain that you're causing or, or it'll zoom in on a crack in your life and be like this is it, you know, mm -hmm. and and then you finish the poem, and uh, it, you, you're, you're bizarrely not always able to have that same clarity that you stumble across in the poem. So, um, and and there can be a bizarre feeling of narcissism as well in writing in writing a poem because you are deliberately spending so much time inside the visual landscape of your own head, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and writing about like, oh God, isn't it awful that, that, that you know, the people that I love are suffering. It's like, but it's, well, you're not making them a cup of tea, are you? <laughs> writing a poem, you think? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, totally. I mean, uh, and that actually um, brings me onto a question from Gail Webb, uh, which is that she asks, um, what can you offer as a poet um, to the world in these times of quarantine and social distance? Um, and also, do you think that poetry will be changed forever by the COVID? you know, pandemic? Oh, Lord. Um, it, well, I, I don't, what can I offer? Obviously, every time you sit down to write a poem, it comes from the desire to communicate, not necessarily to communicate to an actual particular person or group of people. It's almost like, but it's this sense of leaning outside of yourself, like through the window of the page to this kind of peopled loneliness on the other side, right? You know, yeah. it's a bit like, um, uh, there's a, here a Lindsay Bird quote about po poems being like a, a broken telephone that you use to tell the dead a joke, right? Mm. Which I love. But this idea of, yeah, that you're constantly picking up this broken telephone and talking into it, like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? You know, and so there's there's something very very it, human and longing and vulnerable about just the gesture of writing a poem, um, and and we definitely need that now. We need to um, you know sur surrender to our need to to communicate. You know, and but not just not in not in not in a trivial way either. Like poetry just cuts through the small talk of the world and just you know. Um, but I, that's the that's the best I can answer. Re yeah, really, I think that's we're in the thick of it, aren't we? You know. Yeah, sadly. Um, and I I suppose the other thing was whether poetry will be changed by the pandemic. And presumably, I mean, it's hard to yeah, it's hard to know now, but it probably will be. I mean, all these things, big events do kind of have their mark on on like literature of course yeah it's 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 hard to know because we're in we're in a moment of kind of collective like trauma everywhere around the world like everyone's experiencing the same thing whereas and a, and a poem is about generally about zooming in on the specific in order to find the universal so if you if we're writing about coronavirus we're already writing about the universal rather than specific even though it's our specific so we, we, we're going to have to figure out a whole new way of coming at it in an original way and it's, yeah. it's not easy to write about at all <laughs> no i know um uh could you possibly read the girl who cried love please yes um which find yeah it's on page 24 yeah the girl who cried love. The hovel belonging to the high priestess of love was even smaller and dirtier than I remembered. It looked like an igloo made from shit. The doormat was a slab of stone with welcome scratched into it with a penknife. It is difficult to make a doormat sound sarcastic. As I stooped to enter, three giant wind chimes the size of trombones clattered stressfully above my head. A needlework sampler in the porch read, home is where the heart is, 
So where the fuck is this? The cuckoo clock ticked a hair too fast like a cocaine heartbeat. There was an electric underfloor cooling system that kept the carpet permanently cold. You're back, said the priestess. She snapped open a deck chair for me. I jumped in terror. It's just a chair, she smirked, but we both knew she'd done it on purpose. She sat, or swayed, in a child's swing with her legs through the leg holes. She was tiny. You've come for a key, yes, priestess, to unlock the heart of a beautiful maiden, yes, priestess. I sat in the damp deck chair as she swung before me like a rancid pendulum. I've given you shitloads of keys. Aren't you bored yet? This is the last one. That's what you always say. This time it's true. You always say that too. I never knew the meaning of love before. And that. I recently learned a new word, transformative. You have it tattooed on your neck. Do I? I only learnt it two weeks ago. I tried to look at my neck. It's like watching the same play over and over with a slightly older actress in the lead. She threw me a rusty gold key. I caught it. I felt the blood rushing back. I felt my clitoris stabilize for a moment. Till next time, Buster, she said. There won't be a next time, we said together in perfect unison. Stop it, I'm serious, we shouted. Stop predicting my statements, we shouted. I tried to say something original. What else can I trust except my feelings, I said. I smiled triumphantly. She pressed play on her obscenely huge television. A cartoon squirrel was standing mournfully at the foot of a tree, holding an acorn like a skull and soliloquizing, what else can I trust except my feelings? The priestess switched it off. Squirrel Hamlet, she said. Did you create a whole cartoon show just to make that point? I said. She threw a napkin at me with my question written on it. It fluttered like a boneless bird. She stopped her swing by punching the ground so hard she buried her fist. Anchor yourself, she whispered. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a prose poem for people who don't have it, but so it looks like that. Um, I, I want to just, uh, there aren't many prose poems in this, um, and, and I wonder what made you decide that, you know, that was the right form for, for this kind of, um, you yeah. know, dialogue between these two I, I, I love pro prose poems because they're like a trick, right? And the trick is that they're disguised as a paragraph. And people think, well, nothing that strange can happen in a mm. paragraph. Paragraphs are from, from the world of normality, right? And, but then you can, you can go somewhere really, really, really crazy in a, in a prose poem because they don't follow the normal rules of a paragraph in the way that everything just escalates and escalates, you know? And um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a, a great disguise for extreme surrealism uh, a prose poem james tate called um prose poems uh, a sliver of eternity mm. like disguised as a paragraph which which, which i love yeah I, I love that yeah the the trickiness and i also love the controversy you know that people are like well this doesn't look like a poem <laughs> oh, and they get very upset because of poetry <laughs> <laughs> throw it on the ground um <laughs> Yeah, and also, so just uh, uh, what I what I particularly like about this poem is that, that it captures this sense that I sometimes have when I'm I get really like bored of being in my head, and it feels like terrible that this is the bargain I'll be here for forever sort of thing. And I wondered if if write, reading and writing helps you kind of get out of your own head. Is that the is that your kind of way of forgetting yourself um, when you read and write, or do you do you have a very conscious sense of yourself even when you're doing those things? Um, I don't know why like the, the the writing of the poetry doesn't kind of it, r release the pressure of my head in that way i mean when i write plays that does help because it's kind of i can then because when i'm writing poetry i'm so like inside the i'm so behind the windscreen of myself whereas mm. if i when I'm writing plays, I can write about ideas that aren't mine. I can write about other people's experiences. I can feel like I'm kind of above the chessboard looking down. And so I think I, I, it's, a very di it's a very different place for me. And um, I think it, it helps balance, balance me out. I go through like seasons. I go through poetry, poetry seasons where I just write poetry all the time to the point of it, you know, it's very antisocial and I get quite odd. 
and mm-hmm. then I and then I'll go for a playwriting season where I'm much more you know <laughs> uh, of the world <laughs> yeah great um could you possibly read dive bar please yes uh, thank so, you so this one um it came about i was i was commissioned to write a poem for an anthology called pride proud about uh, gay pride and i thought i'd find it quite well not simple but i thought i'd you know because i've known i was gay since i was 13 but actually gay pride is is a very strange it's the interesting it's different from normal type of pride in the way that it is a counter emotion to being told to feel ashamed you know so it's got all of this hurt in it as well and sadness and and re- kind of re- anger as well as celebration, like as if like every sequin um, is overcoming the same amount of darkness, you know, and we're going to need loads of sequins. And so I, I was researching this bar called The Gateways, which is one of the few places that lesbians could meet in the 1930s and 40s uh, safely in London. And the description of it on Wikipedia is through a red door down a steep flight of stairs into a windowless cellar which I thought, I mean, such a beautiful description, but also so bleak in terms of being driven underground. Um, So this poem is called, yeah, Dive Bar. Um, Through a red door, down a steep flight of stairs into a windowless cellar with sweating walls. An ingenue in a smoking jacket sits astride a piano. As a host of swaying women sing your secret safe with me, and one invites you into the privacy of a kiss. All these dark clandestine places, and you find yourself imagining a very tiny woman walking straight into her mouth, through a red door, down a steep flight of stairs, into a windowless cell with breathing walls. An ingenue in a smoke jacket sits astride a piano, as a host of swallowed women sing your secrets in a safe. The barmaid shakes a custom cocktail she calls a private kiss. All these dark half-eaten faces and you find yourself imagining a tiny, tiny woman walking straight into her mouth through a red breath down a dark thought into a swallowed sense with shrinking walls. An innuendo in stomach acid slops astride a piano as a host of silent passions mouth your secret is yourself inside the belly of the world all these dark dissolving spaces and you find yourself imagining a windowless woman breaking walls down in herself, sprinting up the shrinking halls and up contracting corridors and up the choking fits of hard stairs through dark thoughts and dead laws through the red door as it swallows shut behind you. Now you're spat out on the pavement with the sun just coming out. Thanks so much. Um, I, I've, we've spoken about how um, it wasn't until the last book that you started saying she um, in your poems instead of you know you, which is obviously much more uh, like ambiguous in terms of gender. Um, and uh, I think one of the joys of, of this book is that the sexuality kind of just you know bursts out of it. Um, and so, so I, I wondered if you could talk about like how your writing has changed um, over because you you know you've been writing for a very long time. Uh, you, your first collection came out when you were fifteen. You, you knew you were gay by then. Um, yeah. yeah, how that's all changed for you. It's really interesting. So like, cause yeah, even though I came out when I was 14, you know, coming out is like a really long process. And it's not just because everyone knows you're gay doesn't mean that you've like shed all your sediments of shame and then they get added to and it's like, it's, it's a constant back and forth. And, and because I had, yeah, the, my first book pu- published when I was 15, I remember I had a poem that was, didn't, it didn't go into the manuscript called Brigadoon that was, about realizing I was gay and it was it I mean it was very very hidden in it but I I was just terrified about putting it in and 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 it just it felt like I I was going to be feel really exposed and well but then and then that kind of self-censorship despite I mean not being really conscious of it lasted quite a while I would just consciously unconsciously change she to you all the time in the poems um and then and then with In These Days of Prohibition, I wrote this poem called Stephanie, um, where it was definitely, that was what it was about. <laughs> and, uh, and it was, it was really, um, it opened up, it made my masks a lot thinner in my, in my writing, I think. And, and, and the poems just became a lot s- s- sexier and, and, um, 
so that some something is it it it, it th there was a censorship it, like you is not the same as she you know yeah. it's just not um and uh, yeah so so yeah it's a, a whole new world um i, I was actually going to ask like um Actually, maybe I'll save this question for uh, for once you've read your next poem, just to make sure that we, we've got uh, enough under our belt. Could you possibly read Rookie, which is probably one of my favourite poems in this collection? Yes. Uh, and let me find the page. It's on page 38 for people uh, who have the book. Okay. Rookie. You thought you could ride a bicycle, but turns out those weren't bikes. They were extremely bony horses. And that wasn't a meal you cooked. That was a microwaved hockey puck. And that wasn't a book. That was a taco stuffed with daisies. What if you thought you could tie your laces, but all this time you were just wrapping a whole roll of sellotape round your shoe and hoping for the best. And that piece of paper you thought was your tax return. A crayon drawing of a cat. And your best friend is actually a scarecrow you stole from a field and carted away in a wheelbarrow. Your mobile phone is a strip of bark with numbers scratched into it. Thousands of people have had to replace their doors at much expense after you battered theirs to bits with a hammer, believing that was the correct way to enter a room. You've been pouring pints over your head, playing card games with a pack of stones, Everyone's been so confused by you, opening a bottle of wine with a cutlass, lying on the floor of buses, talking to babies in a terrifyingly loud voice, all the while nodding to yourself like, yeah, this is how it's done. Planting daffodils in a bucket of milk. Thanks very much, that made me laugh. Um, I wondered, you know, whether you, um, whether you kind of, what, what role you think humour plays in poetry? Because so sometimes I think, um, you know, contemporary poetry can feel a bit, um, a bit like cold and serious to people who, who aren't, you know, necessarily coming at it from a position of like lots of experience. Um, so yeah, w why are your poems funny? <laughs> well, like, but, but I have this, like, when I'm teaching, I sometimes use this analogy about a tuning fork where like if I've got, I should have bought a tuning fork for the occasion, right? Ima imagine this pen is a tuning fork, yeah? So you're like, ding, right? When we have a si significant subject matter, like the instinct is to hold it significantly like this, because it matters. But if you do that, then you can't hit, you can't hear it. So it's like this counterintuitive thing where you have to hold the pain lightly in order for it to sing. Does that make sense? And yeah. so, like with with this with this poem, I mean, I was I was a mess when I, I wrote this poem. I was in a lot a lot of pain, and that was that feeling of yeah, I everything's just turned to water, and I I I, I don't know how to be alive. I don't know what to do, and and I and I'm just playing the game of following those images, but it's actually it 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 comes from a place of hurt. But it's it's always this this combination between. Basically, you take the, the things that matter to you the most, the things that you are terrified of breaking, and then you juggle with them. Mm. You know, it's yeah. a, a dangerous sport. Yeah, um, I think that's, thank you for that answer, by the way. I, I'm, I'm rushing now, but not because, yeah, I don't want to talk more. Um, we've got room for one more poem, I think. Um, so uh, maybe it could be drawn onward. Um, or if you have a wild preference for tree room. That's fine as well. <laughs> Both are excellent. Uh, let, yeah, I'll, I'll read uh, drawn on with that. That's fine because that, yeah, this is this is very much um, a, a painful game. Um, so it's a, a palindrome poem. So it, and uh, the the other yeah, title is a palindrome as well. Mm -hmm. Right, drawn onward. Please love me a little bit less. I'm standing on your front lawn yelling for a helicopter. Every morning the smell of your perfume gets thicker. I mistook my heart and urges for a twin set. The open road needs someone like me, reversing through hedges in my partner's world. Plenty of others hold tighter. If I had my own theme park, I'd call it Fuck It Monkey. I can't unzip this longing in a service station toilet. 
strangle my rising loss. I must stare down my face in a coke sugared mirror spinning candy floss from the breath of strangers. No images compete with new ones. Not enough oxygen in old kisses compete with new ones. Not enough oxygen in the breath of strangers. No images in a coke sugared mirror spinning candy floss from rising loss. I must stare down my face in a service station toilet, strangle my fuck it monkey. Can't unzip this longing, hold tighter. If I had my own theme park, I'd call it my partner's world. Plenty of others like me reversing through hedges and urges for a twin set. The open road needs someone thicker. I mistook my heart for a helicopter. Every morning, the smell of your perfume gets a little bit less. I'm standing on your front lawn yelling, please love me. Right, brilliant. Thank you so much for, for reading and, and answering all my questions. And thanks to everyone who submitted questions as well. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them, but hopefully most of them um, found their answers in what Caroline was saying. It's been just such a pleasure um, to hear. I feel like I've learned so much. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. I just want to thank both of you and thank you, um, Karen, for showing us inside your process and how you juggle with all the things that matter the most. And thank you again to everyone who sent a question and everyone who came. If you have not already done so, please buy the book. Um, I've put a link to where you can buy it directly from the publisher so you can support Karkinet at the top of the chat. So if you scroll up, you can see it there. Um, next week, we'll be back again um, to hear from David Morley another Karkinet poet. Um, well done, Karkinet. Uh, and he will be introducing Fury. I will be on holiday, but you'll be in the capable hands of Susanna Herbert. Um, so we'll just be heading off in a minute. I'll leave the chat running so you can go up and find those links. Um, and before I go, just a quick um, moment. If you work with young people, know any 16 to 19 year olds, remember we do have the uh, Creative Critics Competition which is a competition where young people can write poems in response to sample poems from poets on the shortlist. I'll pop a link in the chat there. So if you know any young people who are writing poems, that might be one for them. Fantastic. Thank you again, uh, Leif and Caroline. That was fantastic. Um, Thank you so much. And, uh, see you all again. Bye. Bye.